Hello, and thank you for joining us both online and in person today as we gather on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. My name is Erica Jaff, and I am a clinical data manager and the data management operations lead here at the Canadian HIV Trials Network. And it is my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Madeleine Durand. She's a specialist in internal medicine and trained in epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. She is also a previous CTN fellow. And during her fellowship, she established the ongoing Canadian HIV and aging cohort study, CTN 272, and presently leads an independent research program on HIV, <coughs> excuse me, HIV and aging in Montreal. I also have the pleasure of working with Madeleine on the CTN cohort metadata project. And she is the co-lead of the clinical care management core at the CTN. And may I also just say a lovely human being. So, <laughs> Madeline. Thank you so much, Erica, for the very kind introduction. Your last sentence was definitely the one that was the most important. So thanks for adding this. <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. This is the first time I get to visit the CTN headquarters. And the CTN obviously has been a beacon throughout my research career. So it's a great honor to present to uh, the team here. And welcome to the people online. So uh, first, I want to acknowledge that I am from uh, Montreal, Chonchage, which is the situated on the unceded territory of the Kenyan Kahage people and a traditional meeting place for many First Nations. Uh, the traditional name means where the group and water divides and meet. And I'm very, very grateful to have been a guest uh, on the unceded territories of the Esquimalt, Songhe, and Coast Salish Nations for the past six months now, as I've been um, having a sabbatical uh, period of uh, research based on Vancouver Island. Um, I've learned a lot from um, how, I don't know if I can say how much more advanced uh, the recognition of um, First Nations heritage and the importance of the recognitions that we are invited on those unceded territories, how much more advanced this is in uh, British Columbia. And I think this has taught me a lot uh, on my personal journey towards truth and reconciliation. So I'm also grateful for this. Um, I do have a, a developing conflict of interest that I want to disclose, even though this does not represent at present any financial relationship. I am at present trying to develop a randomized control trial with Vive Healthcare. And uh, oh, it seems that the plan for the presentation, oh, here we go. So the plan for the presentation, I aim to speak about the transition from cohorts in biobanks, so vastly observational studies, towards interventional studies in the field of HIV and aging. And I hope you will not hold it against me if my title was more general than the actual specifics I will speak to in my presentation. But I do hope that the results that I will present today, which are vastly based on my research program, will also lead to a broader discussion about this transition that we will all take together towards uh, what is coming in the, in the couple of next years, towards more interventional trials for HIV and aging. But I do have to start from what I know best, and so I will be telling you the story of CTN 272 um, and discussing together future directions. So this is uh, the great news, and everybody has seen this slide many times. I think it is reasonable to hope now that people living with HIV treated early before there is immune uh, demise can, have, can reach a life expectancy that is similar to those not living with HIV. However, HIV unfortunately remains a model for a chronic inflammatory disease. And before I enter into citing all of those means and medians and things that are true at the populational level, I should stress that this is not true for every single individual living with HIV. We see a very heterogeneous uh, manifestations of HIV as a chronic inflammatory disease. So this is a subtext that should be in your mind as you listen to this presentation and as you see all of these results from observational studies. But what we see is that comorbidity-free life expectancy, so these are the years that you may expect uh, that are ahead of you to live free of the major comorbidities, um, while life expectancy, those two lines that you see presently on the slide, uh, the top line is life expectancy. Um, this is actually in the general population, including everybody. 
Uh, and then the other line, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's not, it's, it's actually not the general population. It's people without HIV infection, I'm sorry that I read this wrong. And then you see the other line, which is slowly, you know, joining so that we're hoping to close this gap. However, this gap in life expectancy in terms of numbers of years. However, if you plot on the same graph, the life expectancy without comorbidity, what you see, and again, the top yellow line is for people who are not living with HIV infection, and the bottom yellow line is, is for people living with HIV infection. The gap is not closing. The gap has not been closing for the past 20 years, and this uh, is actually the basis for my research program. We will be talking a little bit more specifically about cardiovascular disease, simply because for this talk to fit in a reasonable amount of time, talking about every single comorbidity uh, would have been difficult. So I am using cardiovascular disease as an example, also because it happens that I've been studying it more in my personal research program. So I uh, apologize for this bias. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the world today. Uh, it comes after cancers in the resource-rich settings, but it is the number one killer in the world today. And we all know what cardiovascular disease is. It's this progressive clogging of the arteries uh, with accumulation of uh, lipids and immune cells. And it's also those very sudden, complete occlusions of the blood vessels, which will result when it's in the heart in the myocardial infarction, when it's in the brain in the stroke. So it's, it's a chronic disease in the sense that it will accumulate slowly. It's also a very acute disease because the most eloquent clinical manifestations of cardiovascular disease happen when the blood vessels are completely occluded by the blood clots. And we are all very aware of the, of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. But in the specific context of people living with HIV, in addition to the cardiovascular, uh, traditional cardiovascular risk factors, many other things um, are present that must be untangled if we are to truly understand the condition. So there's obviously the long-standing exposure to antiretroviral medication. There's also the chronic antigenic stimulation that is ongoing, and there is um, the, the, the chronic inflammation linked with this. Uh, this is a slide that comes from Croy in February of this year, just to show you the sort of, uh, uh, this was sort of a good recap slide of the HIV and comorbidity session, which is highlighting that um, those are, this is kind of a, not meta-analysis, but it's just a graphical representation of the additional risk attributed to living with HIV infection to increase the chances of having a cardiovascular disease. So the red line shows the identity line, the red line would be 1.0, and you see that numerous studies find a little bit of an extra risk. It's good to put this risk into perspective of the other traditional cardiovascular risk factors and basically, the way to read this graph is that the vertical black line is the identity line. So anything that would overlap here would not cause any uh, additional risk. And the further you go to the right of the graph, then the more uh, uh, potent the risk factor is, or the, the, the more, more risk is added. And so you see the traditional risk factors, and HIV is pictured here at the bottom. So yes, there is risk. It's not the most important in terms of amplitude of effect of the risk factors, but there seems to be a consistent signal of an additional risk. This is the context in which the Canadian HIV and aging cohort study went incepted back when I was a postdoctoral student, a fellow, sorry, under the supervision of Cécile Tremblay. And the research questions, oh, struggling with animations, I'm sorry. The research questions of the Czech study were fairly straightforward and we were interested in knowing uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to show the, the, the bit of the Canadian HIV and aging cohort study um, that relates to cardiovascular disease to be coherent with the, with the overall talk. So basically, we're wondering, do people living with HIV have the same amount and do they have the same type of cardiovascular disease or do they get to cardiovascular to have a different sort of cardiovascular disease? Importantly, because from the inception of this cohort, we were hoping to identify pathways that we could target with intervention. So importantly, do they get to cardiovascular disease by the same ways as people uh, who are not affected with HIV? 
So in a nutshell, the CTN 272 is a, is a prospective ongoing cohort study. It was funded through two team grants from CIHR. Um, so the design is a prospective cohort study and affiliated biobank. Uh, it was designed from the beginning to be a very collaborative study between the clinical follow-up and fundamental laboratories that could use the clinical data and the content of the biobanks to discover novel pathways of disease. Uh, the inclusion criteria are very broad. Uh, basically, they are to be uh, aged 40 or older or to have lived with the virus for more than 15 years. And this cohort includes um, people not living with HIV. The follow-ups now are every two years, so they're actually not very intense. And the primary outcome, which I'm not going to show the results of today because the cohort is still ongoing, is overt cardiovascular disease. So myocardial infarction, stroke, and so on and so forth. And we do have a cardiovascular imaging some studies in which participants that have a median calculated 10 year risk of suffering cardiovascular disease uh, are invited to undergo cardiac CT scans. And basically what we do with the cardiac CT scans is that we inject iodine in the arteries so we can see the lumen of the coronary arteries. We can see if the lumen has been narrowed by cardiovascular disease and we can sequence the atherosclerotic plaque to study its content and uh, quality. So, so I want to show you some baseline characteristics of participants to the Canadian HIV and aging cohort study, because I do think there are important things to show here. Um, so uh, first, these are very young people, actually, they're about, uh, about 55 years of age. And the, the, the column from the middle is the people living with HIV, and the column at the right is the people that are not affected with the in infection. Um, the first thing that was very sad for me and probably one of my biggest regrets is that we, we vastly failed to recruit enough women living with HIV, so the cohort is predominantly male. And uh, sad messages, so the way we recruited people who are not living with HIV in this cohort is that we went to the same clinics that were uh, delivering healthcare to people living with HIV, and we tried to recruit from the sa same source population. Uh, we recruited friends, partners, volunteers as well. So we did try to have a control group um, that came from the same population as the people living with HIV. And even though uh, we did this, what we see, unfortunately, is that very important social determinants of health, such as education and uh, annual income, uh, are lower for people living with HIV, which is something that is very important to keep in mind as we think of the pathogenesis of disease. In terms of the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, what we see, uh, you still have the same columns So the people living with HIV in the middle, is that people are not more likely to have high blood pressure, people are not more likely to have diabetes, uh, people living with HIV are thinner, uh, unfortunately, they have more chances of being sedentary, and maybe most unfortunately, they have more chances of having been exposed or still being exposed to cigarette smoking. Uh, what did we find? So, so I'm not showing you the results of the clinically over cardiovascular disease because this is ongoing, but what we find when we look into the heart of the cardiac CT scans is that in terms, this isn't, this isn't on the slides, but in terms of total volume of coronary disease, there is no more coronary disease in people living with HIV after you adjust for the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, which I've shown you in the previous slide, were unbalanced. Basically, after you adjust for cigarette smoking, then there is no more volume of atherosclerotic plaque in the heart of people living with HIV in this court. However, the plaque that we do see is a different plaque. So uh, um, atherosclerotic plaque is a very, it's a mixed media, right? There's calcium, there's lipid, there's immune cells. And it's well known in the cardiology literature that if the plaque is, um, has lower attenuation on CT, so it's kind of softer, it's less dense, and it does not contain calcium, then that plaque is actually at a higher risk of rupturing, causing a blood clot and causing the acute event of uh, myocardial infarction. So what we do see is that in the heart of people living with HIV, after adjustment for every traditional cardiovascular risk factors, there is an increase in the volume of non-calcified, more high-risk plaque. 
Uh, we have also, because we had cardiac CT scans, so we could also look at the epicardial fat. So those are the fat depositions around the heart and around the coronary arteries and have demonstrated that the amount of epicardial fat was actually associated with higher risk of plaque features on CT. And then if you remember that red circle, we're, try, we're sort of trying to learn about each of the quarters of the red circle to see where can we act and what can we find that is specific to people living with HIV. So um, a great friend and collaborator, Mohamed Enfar, who works with Cécile Tremblay, uh, has a whole research program focusing on the cytokine IL-32. Uh, it has been demonstrated that IL-32 is involved in cardiovascular disease, and he has demonstrated that it might play a specific role in the context of living with HIV infection. And basically he's shown inflammatory profiles that differ significantly in people living with HIV if they have or do not have cardiovascular disease. This has been the basis for him to develop a whole research program, which is now funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, where we're trying to diversify from cardiovascular disease and see if we can find an inflammatory signature uh, that is specific to people living with HIV and that is also predictive of multiple, we call them premature aging phenotypes. So uh, body composition, frailty, cardiovascular disease, sort of all together. It would make sense from a biological point of view that actually if there's dysregulation in certain specific inflammation pathways, it will not affect only one organ. So this is what we're trying to do with the NIH work to actually diversify to, um, to other organs. Another collaborator is uh, Mohamed Ali Jemabian. He's from Lucan. He was also a city and postdoc uh, while I was one. And this is how we met and we've always worked together. What he has shown is, um, if, so basically he's interested in um, T regulator lymphocytes. Those are lymphocytes that are good guys. They've been demonstrated over and over again in the cardiovascular literature to be to have anti-inflammatory roles and to have roles that go towards the reduction of the size of the atherosclerotic plaque. So we were interested in studying uh, the T regulator lymphocytes in the context of living with HIV. And the first result we saw is highlighted by this red star. And it was that basically people living with HIV with coronary artery disease in their cardiac CT scans had more uh, T regulator lymphocytes. So it was completely contraintuitive to what the general hypothesis was. So what Ali did is that he went to look phenotypically at what's happening with these cells. And the two bottom panels are showing you here that even though there are uh, in quantity more of the cells, in the quality, uh, they are reduced in their markers of uh, competence and they are increased in their markers of senescence. So basically these cells are there in greater numbers, but they are dysfunctional. So this is another specificity that was find, found in this uh, cohort. Oh, I did have an animation, I'm sorry. So, this was sort of looking at inflammation, and I have to say the transition towards intervention in this inflammation quest or quest for what's different with inflammation is not super advanced and not ready for prime time in this cohort, uh, but still advancing very well, and we're hoping to be able to have some preclinical models in the coming years. How about the fourth, uh, the, the other part of our circle, which is viral persistence. So unfortunately, we know that HIV functions with a reservoir dynamic, and then there are reservoirs of uh, integrated HIV DNA in the human body. So Nicolas Chaumont, who is also a partner, a partner uh, from CRCHUM and has a, a program on HIV reservoir and HIV cure and eradication, has measured the size of the HIV reservoir in people with and without coronary artery disease. And what we do see is actually an increase of the reservoir size associated to uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. Keep in mind, this is cross-sectional, so it's not perfect. We are in the process of doing second CT scans. And when we can do it prospectively, then it will give uh, much more of a causation idea. This is very associative, but still it's telling us that maybe even with the potent antiretrovirals that we have and with suppressed viral loads, maybe we can do better about the very specific thing of HIV viral persistence in the human body to reduce chronic comorbidity. 
And this is a story that we're pushing forward now. This is uh, in, in, and I haven't shown you everything about the tax code, but in ev all of the pathways that we've been investigating, this is the one that maybe uh, will be ready the fastest for um, moving towards intervention. And it's also in the type of risk factors of chronic antigenic stimulation. So, and it talks about glycoprotein 120. So most of you will know what glycoprotein 120 is. It's basically uh, the little blip you see on the viral surface. So it's part of the attachment mechanism of HIV with the host cell. Uh, for COVID-19, the same thing is called the spike protein. So basically it's the bleb on the viral membrane, okay? Um, it has been shown previously that the GP120 can be shed either by the virus or even just uh, it can be shed as a viral particle, not as part of a complete virion. Um, and it can be detectable in the blood of, uh, of people living uh, with HIV in the absence of detectable viruses. So GP120 alone could be present in the blood. This is the work mostly driven by the lab of Andres Finzi, who's a viral immunologist also working in CR Schum. And I have to say he's approached me some time ago now, and he said, well, I will measure GP120 in your cohort. And I'm like, you will find none because all of these people are undetectable, thank you. And they've been undetectable for years. And he's like, I think I will find some. And I really did not think this was possible, but he has demonstrated it to me. And basically, the dots that you see uh, are is the distribution of the levels of GP120 in the plasma of uh, people with suppressed viral loads. So he's... he's um, this is sort of new because me measurement of GP120 is not commercially available. It's a difficult assay, uh, but he, he does it in his lab and he has shown to me convincingly that there's actually a variation in the levels of GP120 that can be found in plasma of people living with HIV in spite of suppressed viral load. And what we see in this population coming from the CTN 272 is that there is also a relationship with levels of IL-6. So we know IL-6, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cytokine that's really at the core of general inflammation. And it, it has been associated with various uh, inflammation associated comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease. And you do see a gradient uh, with the people that have more GP120 having more chances of having greater IL-6. This is a little bit of a picture. This comes from an article that was cited here. I don't know why the citation is not. This is a published article by Andres Finzi and uh, uh, Jonathan Prévost. And this is their explicative model. So GP120, which is a little red dot, can be shed. And once it is shed, it can attach to the CD4 site, uh, which is the, the natural binding site, as you know, of HIV. It can also attach to the C4 binding sites on monocytes and induce uh, immune activation of monocytes with secretions of uh, inflammatory cytokines. And once it attaches to the CD4 lymphocytes, along with antibodies that are, that are antibodies that recognize the junction of GP120 and the CD4 binding sites, they can be involved in um, antibody-dependent cellular toxicity. This means that if GP120 flags a CD4 cell, that CD4 cell can be killed even though it is not infected by a virus. So this is the, the, rash, the biological rationale. The good news, okay, I'm sorry, the reference is here. So that reference was for the prior, previous slide as well. The good news in this study, in this story, is that uh, Fostemsavir, which is a new drug, uh, it's a, it's a first-in-class attachment inhibitor and the basis of my developing conflict of interest with the Vive company. Fostemsavir, in vitro, if you add it to cells that have been exposed to GP120, will, um, will change the conformation of GP120 in a way that it will no longer be able to attach to the CD4 sites and no longer be able to activate either the inflammation from the non-infected monocytes and or the cellular killing of the non-infected lymphocytes. So this is in vitro a fantastic news. Will it uh, translate into something beneficial in vivo is what we want to show. Those are very preliminary results. Where uh, the and to tell you the whole story, if you look at the GP120 levels and the coronary artery disease, you don't see any association in the small sample where we have all those measurements. 
But if you factor in the presence of GP120s and the antibodies that actually recognize the liaison site between the CD4 and the GP120, then you do see a relationship between the size of plaque and the combination of that GP120 and antibody uh, complex. So, so this to me is a ray of hope to see can we find a pathway that is specific to that virus that can modulate the toxic effect of long-standing inflammation in the human body. And so this is the interventional study that we have been designing and are trying to get funded uh, through CIHR grants at present. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be a pilot study because as, as, uh, as I said, we have uh, data from in vitro. Uh, Andres has definitely succeeded in convincing me that this is a plausible biological pathway, even in people that are living with suppressed viral load in plasma. And so I think we absolutely must uh, look, can the addition of Fostemsavir to an already optimized regimen, is it tolerable? And will it modulate key markers of inflammation so that we can reasonably hope that will also modulate the risk of inflammation associated comorbidity in people living with HIV? So this is the rationale and this is the design. Um, uh, the intervention is Fostemsavir added to the uh, antiretroviral regimen versus a comparator, a compar versus a placebo, I'm sorry. Uh, there's lots of feasibility uh, outcome there. Uh, we have to see the tolerability of using this drug on top of the, um, of the usual ARB regimen. And the efficacy outcomes will be mostly biomarkers for this small-ish pilot study. The target sample size is 100 participants split in the two groups. And uh, this slide is showing you sort of a more graphical um, representation of the study. The, the, the idea for the enrollment is to actually enroll people in whom we can detect circulating amounts of GP120 uh, for, for the obvious reasons that we would not want to expose, we, we want to select the population in whom the expected benefits can be the greatest. And so at this point of the presentation, I want to take a step back and I have a couple of take home messages to present. And this is where I think it's time to sort of uh, think not only in terms of CTN 2 set 2 but the entire body of science that is now emerge of uh, HIV science and GERO science that is uh, identifying new pathways towards successful aging and what will the field do with these new pathways as they move towards the stage of interventional research. And the way uh, you should take the phrasing take home messages here is that those are really take home messages from myself to myself. Looking back, so it's not a preachy thing, <laughs> from looking back at my experience of now 10 years um, as principal investigator of CTN 272. So the first take home messages relate to the research question that we set out to answer when we started this cohort, which obviously we're nowhere near uh, finishing to answer, but we can still reflect on some of the findings. And one that is very important is that clearly, Cardiovascular disease presents differently in people who are living with HIV. And I should mention for, for full disclosure that this is a replication of findings and vast cohorts like the MAX cohort, that the uh, uh, coronary artery plaques are different in people living with HIV. Uh, there are new pathophysiological pathways that are associated to cardiovascular disease. I wish I could say in all honesty that cause cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV, and I'm not going to do this because the associations that I've shown you are from cross-sectional uh, studies of, of the CHAC study. But we're in the process now of doing the second cardiac CT scan, so we'll be in a position where we can take baseline exposure to those novel pathways and correlate them with the delta plaque across two years uh, in the coronary artery. So that, that will be interesting, but definitely we see alterations in immune cells. Definitely we see alterations in general patterns of inflammation and inflammatory mediators, and we see changes in reservoir size. We see changes. We, we also see that the persistence of antigenic stimulation from the virus itself in the absence of complete viruses might be something we can target. And that is the story of GP120. And this might be the one that is more readily targetable. <laughs> and this is the RCT that we're preparing. Oh. And this is this is the, the sort of um, 
<laughs> I think I was very naive when I was like postdoc. And I think I wrote in my grants that I was going to do this whole cycle in my research program, like, you know, create a cohort, do a biobank, five level pathways, test them and change the clinic. And I think I actually got told that for being so naive at the time. But you know what? <laughs> it might happen. And, and, and this is the model of, uh, this is a general model of translational research. It's the one I drew for myself as sort of, as sort of the overarching goal of the Chax cohort. And, uh, and definitely we've established CTN 272. Definitely we've had a well-used biobank. And, you know, in typical researcher bias, I have not shown you the 10 projects that have led to being inconclusive or uninterpretable, but there have been a lot of that as well. But I do think that extensive sharing uh, of the samples of the participants that give their blood and time to this research with different labs, uh, in the end was a good strategy and I definitely have learned a lot uh, and we're seeing uh, some pathways now that are ready to be taken to the to the interventional levels and hopefully 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 we can give back to to yes to the participants and to also the greater community of people living with HIV by uh, finding interventions that can modulate the risk of chronic inflammation. But what else have I learned from all those years? This is again, I'm gonna say it, perhaps my biggest regret. Uh, I have miserably failed at obtaining a good representation of women living with HIV and the Chax cohort. Um, th this is bad for obviously a number of reasons, including equity, but uh, also for science, there is no way we can even reach valid scientific conclusions if we do not have a significant involvement of women. Women have a distinct immune system, women age differently, women have a different manifestation of cardiovascular disease. So this is extremely important. Uh, we are not the only ones that have failed. This is a meta-analysis showing the representation of women in HIV uh, trials. Women's Women uh, worldwide are 53% of people living with HIV. So they're actually a little bit more than half. And if you uh, see just this last column here, this is actually the percentage, the median percentage of women that was included in the uh, antiretroviral studies and vac uh, vaccine studies and in cure studies. So, so women are uh, vastly underrepresented uh, in HIV studies worldwide, and this is severely undermining our capacity to reach scientific conclusions, in my opinion. So uh, thanks to CTN here, because through the network, we were able to add the uh, Oak Tree Clinic to CTN 72, and they've started, and this was unfortunately really delayed by the pandemic, but Melanie Murray has been working so hard on this, and I cannot thank her enough, and they've started recruiting, and we've opened a new cardiac CT scan site in St. Paul's here, so that women from the Oak Tree Clinic can also have cardiac CT scans. I think, I think they've got seven or eight recruited so far and this, it, these numbers will be going up. So I think that's a, a ray of hope, but definitely, 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 as we move into the interventional side of things, recruiting women is definitely one of my priorities. Um, I keep not having my images. So this was a very sad thing for me to notice, and again, it speaks to how naive I was as a young researcher, I think, but when I looked at the baseline characteristics, which were very limited in terms of what we collected in terms of social determinants of health, the disparity is huge. Uh, it's huge even when the control group was purposely recruited as coming from the same communities. And this is the elephant in the room because the social determinants of health are so important, are such a driver of inflammation-related comorbidities, all of them. And this is something that we need to advocate, advocate, advocate for. And we, in the background of every single study we do, uh, be it the most fundamental of studies or the most clinical of studies, this is something we should always keep in mind. It has been well demonstrated that stress, for example, is associated to inflammation. So, so. Um, even if we want to be very biological, this is the elephant in the room, we always need to think about it. And, um, and this is certainly an important take home message for me. So here's the one that I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to integrate all of these in my research program, but here's the one where I really want to, to design specific projects to address, okay? 
Uh, first, to repeat what I've said in the beginning, aging for everyone, and also for people living with HIV, is highly heterogeneous. Uh, so, so, so some people do not have accelerated aging, whether they live with HIV or not, and some people who are not living with HIV have accelerated aging, and this is, uh, this is for sure. So as we move into the intervention side of things, uh, we need to take into account that interventions must be personalized, and the world of clinical trial is a very binary and simple world where you have one intervention and one outcome and the outcome, it's better if you can make it binary because people like it and you can do Kaplan-Meier curves. But then what will be the outcomes of the interventional uh, trials of HIV and aging? Uh, th there is no way researchers can actually define that on their own. Uh, for sure, we need to implement outcomes that matter to people. We need to co-design these outcomes so that they're, we can operate them in the very little flexible framework of a randomized clinical trial, but that still uh, we end up measuring what will matter to people. And so as I'm finally, and with much enthusiasm, seeing the day where I can actually offer an intervention to people and design an interventional, so this is like every researcher's dream to design an interventional trial, I think. Uh, so as I contemplate this and I'm in front of the blank page to write my CIHR grant, what do I write in the outcome section, you know? And it's easy to list a string of comorbidities. It's easy to see, well, it's really myocardial infarction. It's always myocardial infarction, but what more? And to know that, and, and these trials are going to multiply. There will be many interventional trials of HIV and aging to curb the comorbidity. And I think this is a great time and the network is a great place uh, to take that discussion and put it out in the literature. Uh, I, did, I would be amiss not to talk about reprieve in this, in this um, presentation, because reprieve, we should have also a logo on this slide. Let's get the logo up. Okay. So reprieve is the first example of a large scale study. I used to, like, I give lectures to clinicians all the time, like, what do I do more to prevent comorbidity if the person I'm with is living with HIV? And the answer has always been traditional cardiovascular risk factors, traditional cardiovascular and viral control, and, you know, ARVs. And it, it, it's kind of a downer, you know? The, you, you keep the, telling people, oh, there might be accelerated aging, you'll get this and that faster, what do I do about it? Well, I don't have anything to offer, you know? So the reprieve study is actually a game changer, and it's the first game changer. So this is the first time that a study gives a specific answer to the question for people living with HIV. Can I do something more in this case to, present, to prevent cardiovascular disease? Not to take away from their huge achievement, but the intervention is a statin. So it's great that we have something to offer patients, but offering another lipid lowering, a lipid lowering agent to more patients earlier, let's say, let's hope that we can also have other strings to our arc in the coming years, right? Let's try and hope that we can have something that's more HIV specific, that really blocks the pathways that are triggered by the virus. But still, the reprieve study, it was a huge study, over 7,600 people who were at low risk of CVD, so they did not have an indication to take a statin, and they were randomized to a statin versus placebo, followed for, I think, the median follow-up must be more than five years. The study started in 2015. And it was stopped early by the Data Safety and Monitoring Board for efficacy, with the 30% reduction in the primary outcome, which was a composite of uh, overt clinical cardiovascular events. So, so this is the first of a kind, and let's hope that in the coming years we have many more examples like the Reprieve study. So, so I guess I guess what I like to do now is is think. So, how do we best prepare as a research community? Uh, for the interventional trials of HIV and aging. And uh, the first question that I want to think about is how do we reach participants? And obviously this speaks to all the underserved population, but it speaks a lot, lot, lot to women because women are 50% of the people living with HIV in the world and they have been uh, systematically underrepresented uh, in trials. The other very important population that we need to think about, obviously, is people who were born with HIV. So obviously aging starts 
as you come out of the womb. And for uh, obvious reasons of you need outcomes, you will always tend to want to recruit older people, uh, much older people in the trials of aging, because you, for, for practical reasons, you cannot sit around for 50 years waiting for outcomes to happen. But there is a significant threat there um, that people who are born with HIV can be left out of interventional research. And I think that when we design, uh, when we identify the pathways, if, if the pathways link to the presence of the virus in your body, then people who are born with the um, with the infection need to be included early in these trials. So I think we, we need to think of them in particular. Of course, the next very big question is uh, what will we measure? And I've touched a little bit on this. So what does it mean to age well? I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a question that, that has been uh, operationalized in research so well be it in the HIV world or in whatever world. Uh, so, and, and this is actually a question that, that is immensely interesting. And it's a question where everybody needs to weigh in, right? So, so I think this is a great time to get together and co-design and co-develop outcomes that should be implemented in trials of HIV and aging. And um, let's do better than just list a string of comorbidities, you know, and do one trial on osteoporosis and one trial on cardiovascular disease. Let's try to think systemically and try, these are going to need to be huge trials. So we need the outcomes to reflect the complexity of the aging phenomenon. Uh, and obviously, the, this is also why I think this network is and will be and has to be instrumental in this quest because the, the integration between community and researchers in this network, I always found exemplary and I think needs to needs to stay at the core of this network. And, and this is uh, the sine qua non condition to start to co-develop those outcomes together. So how do we prepare? The other thing uh, that's important to say is uh, resources. So. Again, I'm going to be biased in what I'm going to say here because I'm a researcher. I always think about my research first, but we do face a threat uh, at the policy level now that funding for HIV is being merged with funding for uh, sexually uh, transmitted and bloodborne infection uh, in the sense that um, HIV is a chronic inflammatory condition that is non-contagious when you have a suppressed viral load. And so squeezing it in an STBBI framework is going to take away so much. And it's crucial that we fight for resources. We need to fight for HIV exceptionality. We need to not amalgamate HIV and STBBIs because they need different research approaches. And obviously, when you're going to talk about long-term prevention of comorbidity, uh, you're going to talk about much larger trials and much more resources needed. So this is something that we need to uh, advocate for, because obviously a research framework based on STBDIs, which are infectious, curable diseases, for the most part, is not going to align well with the vast resources needed to carry long-standing trials on reduction of uh, inflammatory comorbidities. Uh, and then I added how uh, can the network contribute, but I hope I've alluded to that throughout the talk uh, uh, immensely. The, 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 the answer is that we are so well positioned within this network. Uh, first, we also have a chronic condition of working together for 30 years, and let's hope that we've learned a lot from that. Uh, so, so definitely the network is so well placed to place Canada at the forefront of this uh, paradigm shift in interventional HIV research. This is the, the end of my content, but I did want to sort of give some publicity to the International Coalition of Older People Living with HIV, which is called ICOP HIV, uh, which is a community-based uh, initiative that is uh, spearheaded among other organizations by Realize. And Kurt Merzin has kindly um, has kindly invited me to some of those meetings and allowed me to share this slide. And I have to say that the richness of the discussion that I found in this network uh, blew me away. And so uh, I think that definitely within our network and internationally, um, so many important things are being discussed to make sure that these priorities stay uh, in the agenda and that we develop like we want to be developing. 
Here's another uh, uh, shameless self-promotion about the fourth Canadian HIV and aging conference. This is organized by, co-organized by Jacqueline McMillan and many others, including in this room. And Jacqueline was successful. We learned the day before yesterday in getting this funded through CIHR. This is going to be a hybrid event. It's going to showcase uh, lots of Canadian content as well as some international, and it's going to uh, have a balance of uh, community research and policy. So it's going to be three half days in hybrid mode. Please save the dates on the 18th and 19th, and actually 20th uh, of October 2023. And uh, with this, just a, a thank you slide. Maybe I should under, uh, underline thank you to everybody in this room. I'm sorry that some of your individual names are actually grouped uh, on that slide on the, on the general terms, but uh, definitely thank you for the ongoing uh, support of this network in my personal development, as well as in the CTN 272 development. And uh, there we go. So thank you.